Welcome to Story Collider. Yeah! <laughs> awesome. First of all, to everyone here, I'd like to submit a personal invitation for you to join my rock club. And my rocks explode into the atmosphere. It's way cooler than any rock club you've ever been rejected from. <laughs> Let me know if you want to join in later. So when I was 13 years old, I knew that I was going to be a volcanologist and get a PhD. I'd been obsessed with volcanoes since I was a little girl, and I finally knew that this was actually a career option. So two decades later, I finally reached this goal. I got my PhD. You'd think that I'd be filled with relief and pride, but I was focused on what the heck am I going to do now? Being a non-US citizen, being a Kiwi, in the US, I was faced with the need to get a job or leave the country and my life here behind, and I really didn't want to leave you guys. So I had my priorities straight. Get a job now or leave the country and my life here behind. I had no idea that life did not care about my priorities at the time. On the other side of the planet, a very powerful set of events had already begun unfolding. On the 20th of September, 2017, a volcano in Bali, Indonesia, entered my life. Agung Volcano had just been raised to alert level three out of four, the second highest alert level. Now, with 40 volcanoes-ish around, vol around the world erupting on any given day, this in itself is no big deal, but the location was. Having been to Bali, I knew that this is an island that relies on international tourism. It is an Instagrammer's dream. I sent out a tweet on Twitter about the alert level increase as I had so many times before with so many different volcanoes. This was really nothing special. I'd been on Twitter since 2013 and nothing I'd done had been really important, so this was just another thing I was doing. I had no idea what was about to happen. On the 22nd, a Gung volcano was raised to alert level four out of four, the highest alert level. This meant that there's an elevated chance of a Gung producing an eruption. And looking at how fast the activity had ramped up within a week, it looked like this could happen very soon. This was bad news. This really caught my attention. I started investigating the situation and reading the official Indonesian reports on the volcano using Google Translate because I do not speak Indonesian. I did not see my imminent life derailment occurring as I read. At 11.45 p.m. on the 22nd, I got a message from a friend of mine in Bali. Is the volcano in Bali about to explode? I'm in Bali now. I'd rather rely on a good source of information than random mates on Facebook. I'm weird like that. <laughs> I've just been told that there's an imminent alert of eruption and flights are being canceled. What the heck was going on? This was, I had no idea where this was coming from. So from my home in Pittsburgh, I started investigating what information people actually had access to. I was very concerned with what I found. I had this bad feeling in my gut that got worse with every terrible headline I've read. You might have seen Yellowstone headlines around the world. It's really bad. I went cold with the realization of the potential situation that was unfolding right in front of me. Agung was a volcano that had killed 1,100 people in 1963, and it could do so again. So I started sending out tweets in English, just reporting the official information. As a volcanologist, there are certain rules that I play by. The official information must come from the Volcano Observatory. They're the only people that have all of the monitoring data. They're the only people that have all of the local knowledge about that volcano. It's very important that we do nothing to undermine that or to cause confusion. That's very dangerous. So all I did was work to support their message. I did so. I kept doing this, sending out tweets on Twitter. And then something happened. I didn't see it coming. The world noticed. The international media noticed. Within two weeks, my waking hours switched from day to night. I felt physically ill from the time change. It was like a long hangover without the party. I felt very nervous and very uncomfortable being called a world expert on this volcano that I, haven't, I had been to, but I knew nothing about until this time. 
but I felt like this was the right thing to do. Within those two weeks, the international media noticed, and what I was saying was being relayed to people around the world. People that needed help noticed, and my messages were being relayed on local tourism boards as well. Other scientists noticed, and something happened that I was very careful to not do. I was accused of making my own interpretations of the data. I was devastated. This went against everything that I knew that you don't do as a volcanologist. I couldn't believe this was happening. I went ice cold with this realization of what people thought I was doing. I had too many questions to defend myself at the time. Why didn't they just ask me? Why didn't they look at what I was doing? Everyone I asked said that there was no way that I was doing this, so why did these people think I was? It was a pretty scary time. So this was a defining moment for me. I made a choice to continue. I knew that at this point I was afraid that I'd damaged my career. And my career isn't just a job. I'm a volcanologist, but to me this is who I am. It always has been and it always will. So this was when I made a choice to continue. I decided that it was much more important to continue helping people than it was worrying about being kicked out of the country and ruining my career at that time. This was when the whirlwind of misinformation and the whirlwind that caught me and carried me through this crisis became this decision and I moved forward. I was so afraid. I was looking at this information gap that had formed around this volcano. This gap was... It was a pretty scary gap, and it's going to happen again one day, maybe. This gap forms because even though the local Indonesians did a great job getting out information, Bali is a tourism island, and that means at any one given point, a lot of the people on the island are not from there. It means they do not speak the local language, and they don't know where to get the right information when there is a crisis like a volcanic eruption. So when a volcanic eruption is about to happen, perceived or not perceived, real or not, who is going to fill that gap? Well, at this point, we all know that in this, this time, it was me. So I had stepped in, and I was tweeting out the official information in English. And when this first happened, it was a very insignificant moment because I'd been doing this over and over again. But it made a difference. So when this all started happening, it looked like something was going to happen really quickly. But two months went by with fear-mongering headlines and misinformation, with media screaming that a volcanic eruption was imminent and nothing had happened. In late November, things changed again. Agung is erupting, were the words that I woke up to at 5.30 in the morning after a few hours sleep. Agung is erupting. My response was groaning, oh no. And then the adrenaline kicked in, and I raced out of bed, and I was throwing my clothes on as I raced downstairs to my laptop to try and get this information out. A gung was erupting. It was actually erupting. After two months of this taking up every second of my life and taking up international media's interest around the world, this volcano was actually erupting. It was showtime. I was focused. I was on high alert. I was nervous. I was really afraid that people were going to get hurt or killed and that I could have done something to prevent it. This volcano had killed people in the recent past and it could do so again. People needed the right information, they needed to know what the hazards were and they needed to know how to stay safe. This could have been really bad. But thank goodness, this time, it didn't. No one died. It was okay. So after all of this, with this volcanic eruption, this media disaster that happened, there have been a lot of lessons learned. I feared that this was going to ruin my career, and it was only recently that I realized it did not. In fact, it's completely changed my career and my life. I'm still in touch with people in Bali, and our lives are much different now. I'm here at AGU to discuss the lessons that I've learned and to build networks to fill this gap. I'm very afraid that this could happen again and the next time we won't be so lucky. Thank you.